This is what everybody wants, salads in the middle of the winter. And as I said, the history goes back a long time. And the best part of it was, took place in Paris. And between 1850 and about 1910, up to 1 16th, 6% of the total land area of the city of Paris was covered with market gardens. And we said, well, what if we put these frames inside a greenhouse? And this was the great leap forward. First, there's no snow down the back of your neck when you're out there trying to harvest things in the middle of the winter. But also, this was when we realized that, that by having two layers, it really made all the difference in the world. In the middle of February, the soil's unfrozen. We've harvested that whole bed of leeks. We put in a little extra compost, and it's in carrots. So long on about the time I want to put my tomatoes under this unheated greenhouse in early May. This is now a field of carrots. I slide it off of there and slide it over here and put my tomatoes in here. That greenhouse is filled with tomatoes as usual. Tomatoes bring in three times as much as the second crop at our uh, market stand, uh, at, at our farm, uh, farm stand every year. Over the course of one year with this one greenhouse, we are getting a thousand square feet of an overwintered crop, either spinach or those onions. It moves off of there to plot two, the 25th of March. The spinach is finished by then. The onions don't need the protection. We'll put an inner layer on them, which they had all winter, actually. End of March, we're sowing carrots. So I got a thousand square feet of onions. I got a thousand square feet of carrots. The carrots are safe by the 25th of April, and I put in transplants of early zucchini. Well, the minute you put in this inner layer, at night, all the moisture under here, because it's cold, rises up and collects on the bottom of your fabric. So that you have this wonderful layer of moisture all the way across there that is equally as effective at radiating back the heat from the earth as glass would be. Who would buy Claytonia? Go stick bags of Claytonia in the supermarket and see how well it sells. It's going to sell. Man, you can hide that in a salad mix and people think it's the most wonderful thing going. And it has one other great advantage. It's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you know, you've got, you got an 80-pound order and you're wandering around saying, wait, I need weight. Where am I going to find weight? We aim to not grow anything that doesn't return us a buck fifty a square foot for the two months that it oper uh, inhabits greenhouse space. And uh, uh, lettuce was bringing at least a buck fifty a head and better, so head per square foot, that was doing all right. The meadow vole, man, these guys. I occasionally look like Bill Murray and Caddyshack out there, I tell you. I'm, <laughs> We tried everything. We tried every imaginable bait. We even got into macadamia nut butter. We thought maybe these guys had expensive tastes. That actually worked, but after the second or third vole, you don't get another one. And you know, the, the word is that the th third or fourth vole comes along and goes, oh yeah, last time I smelled that, Uncle Harry bought the farm. And that's it. They don't touch it again. So we figured this out. We built these little wooden boxes. We did everything to make them real. This is a very rough file, making it look like a mouse. I actually made that hole. <laughs> and you put two unbaited traps in there. No smell other than after the first vole goes in there, it smells like vole. Swiss chard is one of the most beautiful and hard to sell crops that ever been invented, especially the colorful ones, these big beautiful stems which no one knows how to eat. And the leaves by the time you get to that point are awful leathery. So we said, what would happen if we harvested these things no bigger than our hand and cut them with no stem? We said, okay, but if we do this, we need a new name. So we renamed it butter chard. <laughs> Within two weeks, Half of the restaurants that we were selling to had a butter charred salad on their menu. I think the young grower, beginning grower, the grower who says, well, I wish things were working better, try and spend more time making compost. Get all the ingredients you can. This is one of the heaps on the farm. Uh, I get a neighbor who makes hay and he gets rained on. I pay him bailing costs. He's glad to deliver them to me. That's about 12 feet by 50 feet. This was the original pinpoint cedar, and it put in four rows at two and a quarter inches. <laughs> they, don't, they don't come up quite that fast in reality, but... <laughs> it, 
if, if you look at the axle, I hope you can see it on that slide, yeah, it's got different sized holes in it in groups of four. Who the heck buys these creatures? And we grow this color because they're prettiest. Kohlrabi, what's kohlrabi? Well, we learned that when we harvested them, if we left a couple of little leaves in the center, we sold twice as many because they look cuter. This was our stir-fry pack. And the same company, Atla Pack, that makes those flat sheets of cellophane for us will make cellophane bags for us. And so this had one tatsoi, one bok choy, a shunkyu pink radish, a carrot, a leek, and a hakurai turnip with greens in there. So this was your whole evening stir-fry right in one bag. And I thank you very much for your attention. I will take questions. <laughs>